Hi, this is Ken Sagos, a.k.a. Ken Page from A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3 and 4, and you're listening to Elm Street Radio. This lump over here, this is Kincaid, and I want you to take a good look. See, he gets himself thrown in the quiet room so often that you probably won't see a whole lot of him. Ain't that right, Cool Breeze? Right. I do it so I don't have to look at your ugly face all the time. Welcome to Elm Street Radio, Fred Heads. I am your host, Deandra, and today I have a special guest co-host. You remember him from our discussion of the alternate script for Nightmare on Elm Street, Three Dream Warriors. Of course, it is author and my good friend and super Nightmare fan, Anthony Brownlee. Welcome, Anthony. Hello out there, Nightmare fans. And to accompany us today in our discussion is none other than Kincaid himself, Ken Sagos. Ken, welcome to the show. I'm glad to be here. It's just a great honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Uh, I've mentioned this many, many times uh, when I talk about Elm Street, and Kincaid, of course, is one of my favorite characters in the franchise. He always makes me laugh. Um, we did, Paige and I, um, who could not make it today, unfortunately, because of technical difficulties, as always, we had a list of our top five favorite non-traditional Freddy kills, I guess. When people usually make lists, they always will have certain nightmare kills that they will list in the top five, and they're fairly predictable. But my top one, and I believe hers was, or her, yours was one of them, uh, but my top one was yours. Um, from part four. Unfortunate as it is, I love when you tell Freddy that you'll see him in hell and he says, Freddy, tell him Freddy sent you. And I just love that whole thing, the resurrection by dog pee. I mean, it's, it's a <laughs> wild, wild scene, but, but I love it. And of course, I love Kincaid. I'll see you in hell. Tell him Freddy sent you. Oh, thank you, thank you. It was yeah. that, that's my favorite too. It's 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 my favorite killing. <laughs> I guess it's the only killing I've had. So, but um, yeah, I really really enjoyed. It. Thank you for letting it be a part of it because there's so many great. I hate to say this word, killing in Nightmare on Elm Street, and to be one of the top ten is is really really great. <laughs> Now, were you sad when uh, you realized that Kincaid had to go? Was it like, you know, when you read the script and you're like, we you kind of like this, oh, man, like, you know, that feeling? Oh, oh yeah, I guess uh, being, uh, <laughs> I was more sad that I, no more checks. So, <laughs> yeah, let's, get to, let's get to the real nightmare. Oh, no more checks. <laughs> uh, but, you know, of, of course, but, you know, but, um, you know, but, you know, like I always say, being an African-American that survived a major horror film and returned to a sequel, I, I, I made history. And so that was twofold there, you know. I had made history, and I always say they forgot the key over there and said, oh, let's go back and do this right. So, <laughs> but, but, yeah, I was somewhat sad. But I think the way they did it, they gave my character such homage, and I think it was a setup that I was going to come back because my character is the only one that says to Freddie, I will see you again. And so I think that, and there was rumors, I don't know how true they were, that Ken Kate was supposed to come back in a future uh, movie and fight uh, Freddy Krueger. So, and I think there was a setup that just didn't go through. I heard wow. that too. I heard yeah. that Kincaid was supposed to come back, and I know that he comes back in some of the comics, and he can mm -hmm. actually turn into a panther, a black panther, which I think is really, really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Are you for real? Well, yeah. I was somebody show. You mean I was a black panther and didn't know it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, I gotta call in to this show more often. 
<laughs> yeah, 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 which I think is it's really definitely cool. in the comics. Yeah, yeah. It's like a handful just... of the Dream Warriors that come back. Like a few of them, like they turn to like Jennifer. She comes back and like she's like a her head's in the TV, but she's like a like a fighter. And then Jennifer or uh, Taryn comes and she's like something in the dream. And it's like so all of you all have like a certain dream power still within the dream. Yeah, and Kincaid is one of the leaders of the Dream Warriors when they come back. Well, why didn't somebody tell me? <laughs> We're telling you now. <laughs> I guess I should have. I guess I should have called in to um, Elm Street, uh, the station, a long time ago. Is there, is there any copies out there that I can find? I would like to see that, really. Yeah, um, there are mm-hmm. some physical copies, but I can get you a link to nightmareonelmstreetfilms dot com. They have the comics online that you could also read right right there. So I can get you a link to those. And I love I loved reading that. I was like, why didn't they put that in any of the movies? Why didn't he turn into a panther and take out Freddy in part part four? That wow. would have been so cool. Right. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. It would have been nice if the wizard could have turned me into a panther. You know, hey. Uh, I'm 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 had a loss to words, which is very rare for me, right, Anthony? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! What have I done? I've united the two sass pants. Yes, I was a panther before the Black Panther movie come out. You should have never told me that. <laughs> you were the original. When we had Ira on, we told him he was the original Harry Potter, and you were the original <laughs> Black Panther. So, <laughs> wow. You yeah. know when we have our Q and A, I'm gonna talk about that, right? Oh my goodness! Oh yes, yes, that'll be amazing. I will get you the link. I will get you the link uh, before that. So, um, you know that 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 brings me to another point. Um, well, actually, before we get to that, I kind of want to touch on how you're not only an actor, but you're really a writer. Um, you've done yeah. a lot of writing for shows. Uh, you, you've just done a lot, which Anthony can uh, relate to as a writer himself. Um, so I'm wondering, um, you know, in, in the whole story aspect of like Dream Warriors and in in part four, uh, a lot of people when they really delve into the story elements of those films they'll talk about how part three is basically about people teens dealing with discovery and drug addiction and part four is about them kind of also discovering themselves I mean as a as a creative and as a storyteller because you really started out as that before you were ever an actor did you did you kind of piece that together did that kind of stand out to you does you does it resonate with you now as you've kind of been hearing things about the films or maybe thinking back on them you know for me as I think back out out on them I don't know if uh, you've heard my story but I was not familiar with the nightmare on Elm Street series so I so when I went in audition it was all new to me but as I, you know, get in older and I look back and I see the phenomenal um, clout that this movie has, I am so grateful. But I'm beginning to put pieces together now, and but I did not put them together then. And what makes, for me, what makes it so extraordinary is because I'm just as excited now learning the underlying messages that nightmare had three and four and others that it's like a new beginning to me so as i learn now excitedly you know with the new generation that's learning because i didn't put that together uh what i do think about is that you know we was in a mental institution and even though we was funny i it it I look at what's going on in the world now with so much uh, mental health and everything going on. So it really is a nightmare that's going on now that's paralleling what was going on then. So I hope that answers your question. But I hadn't figured it out then, no. But I, I'm figuring it out now. That's very. I mean, just I mean, just the stuff you were hitting on, because that's what 
usually when I'm writing, you know, I always look to life first. And then I've noticed like a lot of the things seems like of the past are kind of like returning almost like that old line, like, you know, you know, either face your past then or, you know, face it later. And, you know, there is a lot of stuff with mental health going on. And there were so many movies, you know, not just Nightmare 3, but there were like a lot of movies back in the 80s that were dealing with like mental health and and like even suicide and you know that's a big thing right now too and you know it it is funny how it's just kind of making this you know kind of full circle type of thing you know not a good full circle because you know it's it's not really a good thing but you know i i've I've been seeing that a lot myself and i and you know the, the one thing about the group with the dream warriors that i don't think very few touch on is that the, the the dream warriors, at least from my point of view with us, we were a family, or we are a family now. But the other thing about it, what made the dream warriors so good, is that they were loyal to each other. Each one of them was loyal to each other. And loyalty has a lot to do with holding on to something. And, you know, and they talked to each other. You know, they realized that they had each other. And they was willing to go out there and and not just have a nightmare, but to fight their nightmare. And that's I think had a lot to do with the power of the Dream Warriors. Right, I totally agree. Like just that that family that packed, and you know it's yeah. always good to have that. You know, like that family dynamic when you're going through something, you know, that rough because some people don't have that. And then that's what leads them into, you know, darker areas because they don't have that support system. And that, and that is one thing I loved about the Dream Warriors because up until the other nightmares, like one and two, it just seemed like, you know, one person was dealing with like, you know, it was just Nancy in part one. And it seemed like she was just dealing with it. And then in part two, it was just Jesse kind of dealing with it himself. And then like part three really just brings that. A whole circle of like you know it's not just this person or this person it's this you know kind of collective team and you know they've you know decided instead of running from it they're going to come together and just face it you know and you know it's life or death and you know that's why i always love that final scene where nancy's telling you like you know how it's so it's dangerous and you die in this dream it's for real and all of you just say like you know you're just going to go and just deal with it like you know because you have to and I always loved that scene because it was really, I, I just always thought it was really powerful. Yeah, I, um, I, I know that the set on, on Dream Warriors was not the easiest from what I've heard many, many times. Uh, but, it, and I know that, um, there was some improvisation that was allowed for you guys to really shine. And I think, they did such great casting because people love the movie so much and they love it for the characters and their relationship. And it's so real. You could get that real familial element to, you know, what's really going on with the actors who are not just, you know, playing these characters, but really interacting with each other. And I think that that's really powerful. Was that out of all of the sets you've worked on, was that, really one of the strongest that had that sort of familial element to it? When you say all the sets, you mean with the other projects that any, I've been a part yeah, of? Yeah, any, any of your you know TV show roles or, or movie roles? I, 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 the only thing that have come close was Rosewood, but mm. uh, that in itself was a nightmare because of the subject matter. But Nightmare on Elm Street, Three and four, I had the gift of being on some great sets. The set designers and all of them, they built some wonderful sets, you know, that was real. When we was doing the the hell scene where we was walking down in that dungeon, it was really hot in there. And um, it was something that was just helped you get into the mood. When we did the junkyard scene, which took us a week to film, five days, it was really, really, truly amazed when we was walking around in that junkyard. So 
I have been on some great sets, and to be on a set where you have to see this dog, you know, and his fire to bring Freddie back to life, you know. I had some wonderful moments on the Nightmare on Elm Street series, really some fabulous moments. We've had Mick Strawn on the show who worked as the production designer behind the yeah. films, and he's he was a great storyteller talking about a lot of those elements like the, the junkyard where you were. And it's pretty incredible to, to, to look at, to, to listen to how these nightmares really, really came, came to be. And, um, uh, just, I mean, was there any, anything speaking of, you know, watching these sets and creating these, these great special effects and, and these sets, um, was there something that you were kind of amazed by in particular that you watched people do maybe with practical effects or just walking around? Was it the junkyard? Um, what, what kind well, of stood out we to you? Was, we were actually in a junkyard and uh, actually junkyard, but they had went out there and they was able to fix some things to uh, maneuver around where well, like that car that moved around. I didn't see that car move until I was actually, they was getting ready to actually film that shot. They just told me where I could not go. Mm -hmm. So when I saw that car move, that was an actually scare, you know. Um, <laughs> you know, so a lot of the things that they did not tell me that was going to happen, until it happened. And um, even with busting through the wall in part three, they didn't tell me that I was, I knew I was busting through a wall, but I didn't see the wall until I got ready to break through it. But I never saw the other side of the wall. So when I walked through the other side, all that was new. Mm -hmm. That was not a... Act, I was like shocked. You know. <laughs> That's so well. interesting. Speaking of bursting through walls, um, <laughs> there is. <laughs> I, I don't know, Ken. This is this is another fun fact. Maybe you've read it. Maybe you haven't. But did did you ever check out the alternate uh, script to Dream Warriors before the final script, the one that ha was was written with Wes heavily involved? It was much much darker. No, I didn't. I have never seen it. I will, I will send you a link to that, too, because Anthony and I and Paige were a part of a discussion on that. I mean, it was, it was much darker. Freddie was more in your face and, and, and more um, vulgar. He was extremely oh, yeah. extreme. It was a very, very vulgar movie and uh, shocking. And it would have, I think, completely changed the direction of the, the series. But, but Kincaid, unfortunately, does not survive that original script. He's actually trapped. Well, I don't want to see this. Why would I want to see this? <laughs> He's trapped in well, a wall well, and Freddie well, comes out as mouth. talking about that script? <laughs> I was just oh, wondering. Man. I was just wondering. <laughs> I'll send it to you. But yeah, I, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on it because it is so much darker. And that was something that we also talked to Mick Strawn about. He was mentioning that... Um, that the the series took that kind of comedic turn a little bit more because of Robert's personality, and they thought it, it would add some um, uh, color to the story yeah. a little bit more, um, which I thought the story sold itself in any case and would have become an icon in any case, but it was really interesting you know, I know to hear. I, I may get in trouble by saying this here. I don't think Wes Craven and uh, Chuck Russell and all of them decided to go into comedy to make it funny. I think what they did, they were very creative and made those characters real. And they allowed the actors, the I mean the characters, to possess the actors and bring those characters out. And what was brought out was real. You know, because yeah. in, in real life, I think my character would have talked trash just like he did. In real life, I think Ira the Wizard, because that's what he loved, he would have acted that way. I don't think it was written to be funny. I think it was written to be real, and funny came out of it. That's a big difference to me.
Mm-hmm. And, yeah. You know, and um, and so that's the thing because I hear people saying that it went to comedy, and I don't think it went to comedy. It re- went to realism, and there was some comedy in it. And Robert mm-hmm. Engman is such a phenomenal actor. He can really do anything. The world does not know Robert England talent like they should. Yeah. Seriously. If you spend 10 minutes with Robert England and just listen to him, you would probably think he graduated from Harvard But uh, with the knowledge that he has. And so um, I think that's what it was. For Robert England to be able to play Freddie the way that he plays him, it's, to me it's just phenomenal. Now, I'm not saying that another actor cannot play Freddie. I happen to believe that, you know, there is another Freddie out there. It's just that there's not not another Robert England that can play Freddie the way he played Freddie out there. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I uh I I I I think so too. I mean, we we all love Robert, and you know, I've. I've talked to him a couple times and you could just mention the smallest thing and he has this grand story about it that you just can't help but be captivated by because of just this knowledge and his way of storytelling. Those two combined create such a a moment that you just totally suckered in. And I've seen several of, of Robert's performances, but I'm sure that doesn't even scratch the surface because he's just absolutely phenomenal phenomenal Uh, Mm -hmm. but did as as a writer and even though Kincaid got killed off a little bit too early in part four um for my taste wait wait wait. (laughs) much 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 too early (laughs) yeah to throw that in there (laughs) way too early um did you with the writer's strike did you happen to have any input even on maybe your scenes at all no, I, I, I didn't. You see, before I was an actor, I was actually a staff writer at Paramount. And uh, so I had learned early on in my career that you wear one hat. And the hat that they had given me was the hat to act. Mm-hmm. And I don't felt that I had the position to come in there and put on a hat to write. Now, if they had asked me, oh, yes, they would have let loose. <laughs> I would have let loose some stuff. But I was not asked that, and I was appreciative and grateful that I was brought back because my character was actually in the breakdown two weeks before they brought me back, and what that meant that they was, maybe wasn't settled on bringing me back. I don't know, but it was in the breakdown. Um, but, no, I had nothing to to do uh, Chuck Russell and uh, Rennie did ask Rodney and I our opinion and we gave him our opinion and my only opinion that I wanted to really say is why can't I die on page 102 instead of page 10 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah right yeah, I was yeah. always bummed that they that they all died so yeah. early. I mean, I felt like if they had to go, like you know, I felt like it should have been like more epic, and I thought it'd been more of a a grander thing if like you know Kincaid, uh, Joey, and Kristen all like you know maybe went in together and decided like okay, let's try to finish him once and for all, and you know, kind of be like this epic thing. Maybe that lasted for you know, at least the first 30 minutes of the movie before, like, you know, the baton got passed on to Alice as, you know, the main uh, heroine of the of the movie. I just thought, I mean, you know, just me personally, I've just always kind of, like, you know, kind of daydreamed about that a little bit. Just thought that would have been, like, more grander because they were supposed to be the dream warriors, and I felt like they should have gone out more of, like, you know, warriors as a group, like, you know, like they did in part three. Yeah, I, and I would have wanted it to be uh, a little more of a battle between Kincaid and Freddie. But I do understand why they had to do what they did that, you know. Right. Now, 
correct me if I'm wrong, but did Lawrence Fishburne give you some tips while you were on the set of Dream Warriors? And if so, can you share some of them? Yeah, I will always be grateful. There are certain actors who I would always be grateful for that taught me something in my career. Lawrence Fishburne taught me how to do physical acting. And I, and he, like a big brother, he took me to the side, held up his finger, and said, you do not have to do all this. And he told me what to do. And it may not have meant that much to him, but it meant the world to me. And it helped me. I wasn't exhausted after a scene. And I looked better by what he taught me and what he told me. And that was the scene of the, when they was taking me out of the room, when I said, ain't nobody going to put me to sleep. Uh, we must have shot that scene about three or four times. And, um, well, more than that, but, but each time I would give my all, but Lawrence Fishburne took me to the side and talked to me, and I needed that. And every time I see him, I thank him. That's awesome. That's, that's really <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> It's cool. I know it's like really cool. Yeah, to be able to just have like that little moment of like actor to actor wisdom, um, and bestowing knowledge on a fellow actor or um, somebody who is, you know, younger. I think is is really cool, and that's that's a pretty amazing story that he taught you, and he just took you for a moment and just kind of helped you in that and that something like that was able to transform not only your performance, but even how you felt after it. No, I think I, I was a new kid on the block. I'm older than him, by the way, but I was a new kid on the <laughs> block. But, um, and I think he was passing some knowledge down to me because I was represented. And he wanted me to be represented right. Mm -hmm. Because I wasn't just representing myself, I was representing him. And mm -hmm. and he he passed on what so many of us don't do and what so many of us need. I mean, Nightmare 3, and I can only speak so <clears throat> wholly on Nightmare 3, is that Robert passed knowledge on to us. Helga was phenomenal in being a big sister to us. Everybody passed on something to each other, and I think that's why we're family, you know, you know, and that's what it was. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I remember we had talked about that a little bit, how you told me uh, yeah. how you and uh, Heather would, would just, like, have talks, like, in between scenes and such, like, you know, she'd come, you know, see if everybody was okay or, you know, come to trailers and see how everybody was and just talk, and I just always thought that was, you know, just, like, so cool and... No, she actually, she actually did that. She would, she came to you and she would say, are you all right? Because I didn't talk that much, you know, and I was actually working on something. So I would go back to my dressing room and I wasn't uh, so involved. But she would actually come around and say, are you all right? Um, Patricia Arquette, I didn't have a car at the time. She took me home, and I, and I never forgot that. She took me way, way out the way. And it's those little things that you don't forget, you know. And um, hey, it, it was just there. We are really a family. That's so cool. I'm, I'm like, so glad to hear that about you guys. Because, you know, most of the time you hear about, you know, these movies and, you know, people talk about, like, you know, their... Uh, how it was on the sets and things like that. You know, it was fun, like, we were filming it, and, like, you know, some people say, like, oh, we don't really talk anymore. That was years ago. But to hear you say that and just, like, you know, and to see you guys interact with the conventions, like, you know, because, you know, me and DeAndre, we've been to a lot of conventions, and, you know, we've seen you guys, and, it, like, we're just always laughing because, you know, you guys are always just, like, joking with each other, like, you know, you know, like, regular, like, you know, brothers and sisters, like, how they would just goof around and, 
sometimes I just like just sitting back and just like just watching y'all. And it is it's just it's just funny to me because you know you don't you know it you just don't see that a lot, you know. Yes. We all are individuals, uh, but we all are family, and that is really the truth. I mean, I can't say it enough because that's just really what it is. We don't see each other every day or every week or every month, sometimes right. a year. But when we do see each other, it's those three dots behind it like we just saw each other yesterday, and that's what counts. Right. Totally. Right. I um, I have to say something um you were in intolerable cruelty this is like totally out of left field <laughs> but okay so growing up I was a huge Catherine Zeta Jones fan and my parents still have the poster that I got of intolerable cruelty sitting in their basement mounted on a wall and I was like oh my god that's Ken <laughs> <laughs> wow wow yeah, Cedric the Entertainer. That was a great. That was a great moment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there's something else. So uh, it's been a while since I've watched it. So you'll have to, you know, Anthony and I were actually talking about this beforehand. Uh, it was an episode of What's Happening Now, and um, <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm just throwing a bunch of random subjects at you, uh, but uh, the, there was an actor, and Anthony is and I are still trying to find his name, um, but I found, I, I found you found it. Dwayne, Dwayne Davis. Is it is it the same guy? Dwayne Anthony? Davis was in Nightmare on Elm Street. That's what we were yes. saying. Was I was Dwayne, like, four. right? I mean, Nightmare on Elm Street four. <laughs> yes. And this is interesting. You want to know an interesting thing about that? Dwayne yes. Davis. Yes. Dwayne Davis was also up for Ken Kate. Oh, really? What? Yes. I didn't know that. Dwayne, Dwayne Davis was also, I, I want to say it came down, it was me and him, but Dwayne Davis was also up for um, for Ken Kate. Oh, that he is had, he, he really had the body of what they was looking for, for Ken Kate. I didn't, you know, when I, <laughs> I was just wearing big shirts, you know. Right, I think you, I think you had mentioned that or something. Where you saying like yeah. in the script, you Kincaid is like listed as like you know this big muscular like mm-hmm. yeah, like I, I wish head I could, type of guy. Yeah, I wish I could find that breakdown. It was nowhere near me. It was like, why am I going in there? And I and I think my agent at the time he wanted me to go. Uh, he said, just go. So you, this is the way I can get you to meet the casting director, because she's going to be casting some other things down the line. So it was more for me to meet the casting director, but it it turned out that it was a great blessing and everything. But I knew Dwayne uh, very well at the time, and um, I know that he was up for that role. I know he got called back um, two or three times. Yeah, I knew it. I, knew, I recognized his face immediately. I was like, that is... Mm-hmm. Super weird because I I swear that that is the same guy, but I can't find it anywhere to confirm it. And lo and behold, it is. I was actually watching The Hidden, Jack Shoulders The Hidden, and I recognized the dog in there. And I'm like, that looks like Kincaid's dog Jason from part four. And lo and behold, (laughs) it was. It's crazy. Yeah. It's 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 like uh, uh, it's amazing. You know, I guess it would be the same time period, and everyone's kind of working on all the different stuff, so the paths would cross. But I still felt that that was really really interesting. And 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 might I add that uh, I, I was having a conversation with Heather, and she told me I should run for political office. And if I did, I would hope that Daryl would help me out. In running for political office, <laughs> <laughs> put him in a sign, you know, help him write my slogan, all that. I thought the slogan was catchy. Okay, well, I, I think Helva should run for a public office as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I know we've been talking about horror, but I, I do. I have seen a lot of you know some of your films that weren't horror, like you mentioned before, Rosewood. I saw that when I was probably about. 
13 or 14, I want to say. It came on HBO one uh, one night, and I was like, you know, I had never seen this, and then, you know, uh, and then I saw what it was about, like, you know, taking place in, you know, the 17 or 1800s during uh, slavery times, and then, you know, I'm seeing all these acting scenes, Bing Rames and, you know, John Boyd and Esther Rowe, and then all of a sudden, I'm like, is that Ken? And I'm just like, <laughs> oh my God, like, are you serious? And I'm just like, and I love this character. I think what your character's name was Baby, wasn't it? Baby, Big Baby. I, Big Baby. I, I, I love that role because um, I, I only had like a ten-year-old IQ when I was like nineteen or twenty, and I, I love it because I didn't have to think. All I had to do was eat yams. And <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I, I, I that really was... been. I've been blessed with some very nice roles. I do thank God for that. Right. I mean, the actor, I mean, because I was, uh, that's what I said, just to see you, like, with Esther Rowe, I mean, you know, I was a huge Good Times fan. Well, I mean, still am to this day, like, you know, and, you know, getting to, like, you know, work alongside with somebody like that. And I think yeah. well, at least Neil was in the movie, too. And at least Neil was yes, in my screen, Neil. too. And that's part, that's like going back to Wes. And I'm just like, it's all these little connections. I'm just like, that's so cool. Yes. I can say that I can, you know, and I like to talk about the blessings I've had. The, I've had the honor of being on the set with some really phenomenal actors to absorb some of their talents, you know. And it's been really, it's, it's really great. And I, and I hope I continue to do that. Right, like definitely, like we want, like we definitely want to, like you know, see you in more. And what else I see? I saw you in the It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. <laughs> oh yeah, dinner, I saw that, that dinner scene. <laughs> <laughs> she pulled him down. He's like, what? Right. <laughs> <laughs> that was hilarious. Oh, you want to know a story how I got that role? It yes, is, honest <laughs> truth. I I went and I went in on an audition, and um. They told me about the character. I did. I had never watched again. I didn't know what it was either because I didn't have cable. And so, I asked them, "Is this a pilot or something?" And they started laughing. And they said, "Oh, he's <laughs> hilarious." It had been on three years. And I said, "Oh, okay." And I and they stopped laughing. And I said, "I'm really am serious. Is this a pilot?" <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! And so they thought I was doing stand up or something, but I wasn't. I didn't know what I'll, always sunny in Philadelphia is. You know, I had an ex girlfriend from Philadelphia, so that was not funny to me at all. <laughs> <laughs> Philly was Philly was not on my radar. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it was not funny to me in Philadelphia, so that's what I. That's why I, I don't know. That's what happened. That's that's what that's what it is like here in the north. I mean, it's not always not always sunny. Barely sunny. <laughs> I came from northeast Ohio and we had the lake effect and it was rarely ever sunny. We were just like clouds again, of course. But um mm-hmm. Ken, you are you are a real life dream warrior um for a lot of kids. Um and people might not know this about you. But what what you do at conventions helps helps a lot of kids. Can you talk a little bit about that for people who who might not know or or, or you know about well, that? I um in nineteen eighty seven, that is when Nightmare um, Four came out, I believe, and but a year later. I think in 1996, my mother passed. But in 1997, I founded an organization called Giving Back Corporation because I want to help young people and I want to make sure that everyone got an education. And I was one of those young people that I could not afford my books when I went to college. I was one of those people that every summer I saw the yellow bus driving off to take kids to summer camp, but my mom could not afford to pay for me to go. And so I had been helped by people. So 
I wanted to always do something to make sure that I help young people with their education when they go to college, and I help send kids to summer camp. And if they're having problems with their work, that I can pay a tutor to help them with whatever subject they have it with. So with all that being said, all my signing at the uh, at the uh, convention goes toward my organization. It is a nonprofit 501c3 organization that I founded in 1997, and so far I've helped put over 400 kids through college. Some of them have received their PhDs, several master's degrees, and put nearly 5,000 supplies in classrooms across the United States, not just in one area. And I continue to do that. So if you just come by my table and whatever you purchase, it doesn't go to me. It goes to my organization because I believe I am who I am because of the fans. I would never be so arrogant to say I am who I am simply because of me. I am who I am, and no matter how how I fly, the wind beneath my wings are the fans, and that's the reason that I give back. And I don't talk about it. I do it. And you can go on the um, Facebook or wherever and read about my organization to see that I've been doing this since 1997. Wow, that is, like, very inspiring. Like, I'm just, like, <laughs> I'm, like, for real, like, almost in tears. Like, that's, I mean, because education is very important. A lot of kids don't, you know, some of them don't get the same opportunities as others, you know, like, because of, you know, some, you know, financial reasons or, you know, what have you. And, you know, it's always good to have an, an advocate, you know, for, you know, for kids, you know, to get them in school and keep them in school because I think that's a very strong foundation of keeping them, you know, out of trouble, out of the streets and, you know, into something positive. So, you know, that that could be something that they can pass on, you know, later on to someone else, you know, somebody helped me. So I want to try to help the next person. And, and it's, and it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's just, I like to say it's just what I do. I don't, it's not for a purpose except that so many people help me. Right. And my way of saying thank you is that I pass the torch on. And and I just believe in that. I, I, I don't know how else to say it. It's that when people ask you why do you do it, I don't have an answer except that I just believe and I feel good when I do it. And um, so if you just come by my table, you know, as a donation box if you want to give a donation. But it all goes back to my organization, which is a 501c3. And for those who don't know, that means under the federal government, it can be written off at the end of the year. And most nonprofits don't last but three or four years. But I've been around now for more than 20 years, so I'm, I'm, I'm doing really good. And 100% of my support comes from the community and that's why I really really need the support and I have I will have some t-shirts some giving back t-shirts that you know say cultivating our youth and while acknowledging our history and that means every nationality so come by and pick up a t-shirt if you can and order one from the website and I have a lot of items over there all of us gonna have some wonderful items Fantastic. Because, you know, things like this, um, being the change you wish to see in the world is really the catalyst for change. And there's only going to be a ripple effect from there. So absolutely, Ken. And, and, you know, Ken right now is at Days of the Dead in Indianapolis. Um, so his table is, is there. Um, so go by and if you want an autograph, if you want a donation, Ken has a lot of different items that you can pick up. And like he said, the proceeds go to his organization and they help out kids and it really makes a difference. So thank you, Ken, for all that you do for the kids and for always being a very, very kind person and for taking the time with us here today on Elm Street Radio. Is there 
anything that we can uh, maybe catch you in in the future? Are you directing or writing any upcoming movies? I'm, I'm writing now. I, I'm writing now. I, I, um, I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I, I'm writing a story. I don't want to talk about it now, but I am writing a great story. And so, uh, and I enjoy writing, and Anthony can tell you, I think Anthony is a little better writer than I am, but hey, <laughs> but, you know, I, I get that one day. So. <laughs> You're an awesome oh, by, writer. Amazing. By the way, uh, by the way, Mr. Anthony, uh, I do have a t-shirt your size this time, okay? Okay, I'm going to come I'm, by I'm just, here. I'm just I'm throwing a, it out there. Just throwing okay. it out there. Okay. I'm going to look, I'm gonna look for it when I get there. Okay. Okay. Gonna be there for Anthony. You know. You mm-hmm. gonna. You gonna. You gonna. You gonna get that T-shirt this time, right? Mm-hmm. I'm gonna get it. Okay. I, I, I know he gonna. Edit, gonna, gonna have edit my name it. on it, right? Oh, I write your name on it. That's what you want. <laughs> <laughs> I just pardon me for when, being when you, modern, but buy, I can't with you guys. You, when you buy a T-shirt, I would write whatever you want on there. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Okay. I, I I really really enjoyed being here, and I can't wait to see you guys. Wait, well I'm seeing you now, so just come on over <laughs> there and 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 give back and let Ken Cade help kick Freddie's behind our over Dreamland. Amen <laughs> to that. So amen to that. <laughs> thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you, Anthony, and thank you again to Ken for your time. It was a pleasure having you on. Always, always. Until next time, guys, remember, whatever you do, don't fall asleep. Fell up. wake up. A nice stroll, asshole.